Well, hi everyone, this is Bob the Science Guy, and today I'm going to do something that I wanted to do from the start of this channel, and that is develop some lessons and projects for homeschoolers studying science, probably on the high school level. Now, many of you may have noticed that for the last few days, I've been tracking the FRAM2 polar mission. That was the manned SpaceX mission that was in polar orbit around the Earth. I've also been tracking the International Space Station and a variety of CubeSats. And all you need to do for this is get what's called a software-defined radio. Now, there are a lot of different types of software-defined radios that you can get. And I have one of the better ones. And that is this device here, the SDR Play uh, version 1A radio receiver. Uh, and this is what's called a software-defined radio, and it's good, as you can see, for 1 kilohertz all the way up to 2 gigahertz. And you match this with what's called a discone antenna. Now, as you can see, this is similar to the one I have on the roof of my house, and it's good from 25 megahertz all the way up to 1300 megahertz, or 1 1.3 gigahertz. Now, as you can see, my setup ran me just over $200, but you can get a software-defined radio in this range for on the order of $30 to $40. So if you just want to do it for a single project, that's a good option. If you want to do this on a more regular basis and um, do other projects with it, such as looking at the sun, you may want to get that more expensive SDR Play version, which is what I have. Well, what exactly are you going to see with this software-defined radio, and how can you use it to track the International Space Station? Well, the International Space Station has what's called a ham radio repeater on board, and that means that you can call up to the ISS on 148.5 megahertz. It will receive that and rebroadcast it from space on 437.8 megahertz. And that's what we're seeing on the screen behind me. Let me go through that real quick. This is some software called SDR Uno, and it hooks up to my SDR Play software-defined radio. This is free on the internet. And what you do is you tune it to 437.8 megahertz. Now down in the corner, you will see that this is the position of the Fram 2 spaceship, and this is the position of the International Space Station, and these are both in real time. And as you can see, uh, where this cross is, it's approaching Michigan. I can pick up the International Space Station from over 2,200 kilometers away. And what we'll see is these little radio traces coming from that repeater. Now you may notice that that's not on 437.8. Now many of us are familiar with something called the Doppler effect. And that is, uh, for example, when a fire truck is approaching you, you hear the tone of the siren. As it goes away from you, the tone is lower. Well, in reality, the actual tone of the siren is the tone that you hear when it's right next to you. As it is approaching you, that tone appears to be higher, and as it is going away from you, the tone appears to be lower. A similar thing happens with a radio repeater on a satellite, like the ISS. Now, the effect is based on the relative motion between the two objects. So if you are here on Earth, and this is your location, and the ISS is over here, it's going to be following an orbital curve, something like that. Now, when you first hear the radio transmitter in this location, it's going to be greater than the broadcast transmission, which is at 437.8. After the ISS has passed you, and it's going away from you, the radio frequency that you hear will be less than the 437.8. However, when it's right here at your position, this is called station passage, you will hear 437.8. So as we look at the screen on our radio, initially, if it is tuned to 437.8 here, initially you will hear it on this side of the frequency, a little bit higher, and then as it goes away, you'll hear it on the other side of the frequency, a little bit lower. And what you'll see is something that looks like this. And this is the Doppler shift. Now initially, when the ISS is the farthest away from you, say 2200 kilometers, it's essentially coming straight at you. 
it may end up passing you a little to the north or the south, but initially it will be coming towards you and you will hear the radio transmitter at a higher frequency than what is actually being broadcast and it'll stay that way for a while. As it gets closer and closer to you, the angle to the ISS and the relative speed to you changes rapidly. And as a result, you'll get that little curve going from right to left on the waterfall. And then again, as it's going away from you, the farther it gets away from you, the less that frequency will change. So most of the change is right at station passage. Now let's have a look at an actual passage of the ISS to show you exactly what I'm talking about. Now again, here's the actual position of the ISS. As you can see, it's to my northwest and it's going to be coming across in this direction. It's almost passing over my head. So here are the initial tracings from the ISS. Notice the frequency that we're getting. We get some weak signals at first and then we get much stronger signals. Now notice it's starting to shift over to the left. We started about right here. Now here, we have just had station passage, and as you can see, it just passed me here in Michigan. But the signal is actually below 437.8. But we'll go ahead and continue, and we're about halfway through the passage. And then the signal starts to fade out. Is that we can use the received frequency and the transmitted frequency to determine the speed of the object. Let me show you the math behind that. It's actually quite simple. Now the easiest way to understand the Doppler effect is that if you multiply the frequency transmitted by the speed of light plus the velocity of the object divided by the speed of light, you will get the frequency received. Sorry about all the boxes. So we can use this equation to predict where we will first hear the ISS as it comes through. However, that requires that we know the velocity of the ISS. However, what if instead we want to calculate the velocity of the ISS? Well, that's also pretty simple. So we can take the speed of light and we can multiply it by the frequency received over the frequency transmitted and then subtract the velocity of light and that will give us the velocity of the ISS. And that makes sense because the frequency that we receive is going to be a little bit higher than the transmitted frequency as the ISS approaches our position and then it'll be a little lower as it goes away. But let's go ahead and see what the frequencies are. I have the very first transmission I received from the ISS on this particular transit. You'll see here's the tracing. Here's 437.8. Here's 437.81. And if you look at this, it's actually a little bit to the right of that 437.81. So we're going to call it 437.811. And we can also have a look at the other side of the transit. Now as the ISS is going out over the over Canada into the Atlantic Ocean, here is the last transmission that I got from the ISS. And once again you'll see this is 437.8, this is 437.79, and it's a little bit to the left. So we're going to go with 437 0.789. And since both of those values are very close, I think that we've got a pretty good indication that the shift is going to be 0.011. Okay, so here we go. We're cooking with gas now. So our received frequency is going to be 437.811. And our transmitted frequency is going to be 437.8. We're going to use 3.000 times 10 to the 8th meters per second as the speed of light. 
The reason I'm doing this is I want to go ahead and get four significant digits. And when I put these numbers in to my calculator and get a speed for the ISS, I get 7,537.7 meters per second. Now, what is this? That's 7.537 kilometers per second. Now, if you listen to the guys over at NASA, the reported speed of the ISS is 7.650 kilometers per second. I'm 120 meters per second off. Okay, so now we've verified the speed of the ISS independently from what NASA told us. Now, what else can we learn from this? How about if the position that NASA reports is accurate? Well, I told you that we would receive the ISS at 437.8 the actual broadcast frequency at station passage. In other words, if I drew a perpendicular line from the reported orbit of the ISS at the second that we had station passage on the radio, in other words, we received at 437.8, that should go through my house. Let's have a look. So right here, we go from just over 437.8 there to just under right there. And if you look down here very carefully, you will see the position of the ISS. And, it is, and if you draw a line perpendicular to that position along the orbit, that line does indeed go through my house, or at least as close as I can tell. Now, obviously, that's a very small screen you can bring this up to full screen and you'll see exactly where it is and you can actually zoom in on it quite a bit. So now we've verified the speed and we've verified the reported position of the ISS. Is there anything else that we can verify? Well, as a matter of fact, yes. The transit of the ISS took 9.9 .9 minutes. In other words, from my very first detection to my very last detection was 9.9 .9 minutes. Observing the orbit of the ISS on several passes before and after this one, the time from orbit to orbit was 93 minutes. So we can verify not only the rough position over the Earth that we saw the ISS for the first and last time. If we look at 360 degrees over 93 minutes, we can figure out how many degrees that was over 9.9 .9 minutes but you'll see that it roughly corresponds to 2,250 kilometers, and that's on either side of me. Now, another thing that you will see that's very interesting on these tracings are what's called CubeSats. They're generally around 437.51, and they come out as short dots. I'm gonna show you an example of a couple of them. Now, this is actually uh, the live stream right now. We've got a couple of things going here. Uh, we've got Radio Jove down here in the corner, we have the position of the ISS in this corner. This is what's called a propagation beacon. And you notice it kind of goes in and out a little bit. And that's because it's in Morse code or CW. This object right here is what's called a CubeSat. And you notice it's a little bit different from the ISS. It just sends out little short bursts of information, little telemetry bursts. But if you follow this, along, you'll see that it actually exhibits the exact same shift. It'll start a little higher over here, and it'll end up a little bit lower over here. And if you take the average of those two points, so you'll take the frequency here, add it to the frequency here, divide that by two, and that'll be the transmitting frequency. If you want to go ahead and find the velocity of this particular CubeSat. Quick lesson in the radio astronomy of satellites and space stations. Uh, I am going to go ahead and have a look at another phenomena that was rather interesting. And that's something that I picked up the other day uh, as I was getting ready for a transit of the ISS. So you see here, I'm starting to look for the ISS, which is this streak that you see right here. But all of a sudden, something else happened. Look at that. Let's go ahead and bring that forward a little bit just to have a little better look at it. So you see the ISS is coming in very nicely. 
but we've got all of this stuff out here too. I wonder what all of that might be. Tune in for the next video and find out. This is Bob the Science Guy. Thank you very much for stopping by. I do appreciate your support of this channel. Um, the telescope uh, has got to have some repairs done to the uh, shutter and that'll be a couple of weeks before those are ready. We've got to wait for the weather to warm up a little bit and I've got to get some manpower help to get the dome off and things like that. So we'll probably be doing a lot of radio astronomy in the next couple of weeks. It's a fascinating thing. It's cheap and it's something that you can do even in borderline skies. Take care guys.